Amen. Are y'all ready for this message? Amen. You guys have only been standing an hour and three minutes, or Tim, <laughs> Pastor T has. So. Okay, I want to share with you a message this morning. It's a continuation of Wednesday night's message. And I want to share with you today about the joy bucket. Okay? How's your joy bucket? Good. How is your joy bucket? Now, you know what I mean by the joy bucket. It's whatever the bucket is full of, when the bucket gets bumped, is what's going to splash out of the bucket, right? In other words, whatever is in you, whenever you get hit with the circumstance of life, whatever's in the bucket is going to splash out of the bucket. Whatever's in us, Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 12. He said, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you want to know what's in my heart, just listen to me talk. If you want to know what's in my life and what's real to me, just listen to me. If you listen to me long enough, my words will reveal what's going on in my life. Now, when I talk about the joy bucket, whatever you keep filling your life with, is what's going to splash out. For example, if you fill your life constantly with the news and the media and what's going on in Washington, D.C., and how you just keep filling that bucket full of that, you know what's going to happen whenever you get around people? You're going to get with people, and you know what's going to come out of you? Washington, D.C., and all this going on in the world, and I believe we need to be informed, but how many know we also got to think on things that have a good report? So whatever you keep filling your life with, oh, Pastor Tom, I love sports, I love basketball, I love football, I love this. And whatever you keep filling your life with, whenever you get in a crisis, that's what you're going to pull on. Now, what we need to fill our life with is something that's eternal. Jesus said in John chapter 6, he said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You see, whenever we hear the word of the Lord, all of a sudden those words are spiritual. They are life. They are permanent. They are eternal. And whenever we get those words in us, whenever we get into a crisis of life, you know what we do? Inadvertently, we find ourselves talking the word, right? The abundance of the heart, the mouth, what? Speaks. So whenever you keep hearing God's word, you keep filling your life with God's word, then when you get in a crisis, you begin to say, but the word of God says this. And that's what Jesus said he would do in John 14. He said, I will bring my teaching, I will bring it to your remembrance. So we need to constantly think about what are we filling our lives with? A lot of times people say, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, guess what? When you get filled with the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5, says the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the byproduct of the Holy Spirit, of the recreated human spirit is this. In other words, when the Holy Spirit touches the human spirit, he produces love, he produces joy, he produces peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faithfulness and meekness and self-control. But notice he brings joy into our life. Now, I'm going to say this. It's impossible for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit without being filled with joy. Now, there are some things you can do to short-circuit joy. There are things that you can do to kind of booby-trap your joy. Now, I'm going to tell you what a big one is. It's called strife. All right? Now, you're not going to meet people that are walking in strife and they're walking in joy. Now, if, how many are married? Raise your hand up real high. You're married. Have you ever noticed that strife has a way of impacting your joy level? I had one honest person. Yes. Hallelujah. Well, you know, it does. In other words, when people get into strife, what happens? It, it has a way of shutting down the, the, the joy of the Lord in our lives. So this morning when we talk about the joy bucket, whether you're conscious of it or not, we need to allow God's joy to be filled in our lives regardless of the external circumstances that we're going through. Now, sometimes I go through things and I say to myself, 
you know, Sharon, I believe the Lord's allowing this to happen to give us an opportunity to grow in his word. Now, I know there's an attack of the enemy, and I know the enemy's out to steal, kill, and destroy, and the devil is a roaring lion that he walks about seeking whom he may devour. But also know this, and the Bible says, count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into divers tests and trials, knowing this, that the testing of your faith worketh patience, and let patience have its perfect work that you might be perfect and entire, not wanting for anything. So the thing is, there are things that come your way that for whatever reason, we live in a fallen world, they were permitted, they're a growing opportunity, there's things that are happening around us and it gives us an opportunity to grow and use our faith. Now hear this, in the midst of those circumstances, we must keep our joy. I said this Wednesday night, but I tell our boys frequently, I said, now boys, if you're going to wait to have joy whenever you have a perfect day, everything's perfect, and you're going to wait until have joy when everything's perfect, you're going to get about four days a year. How many know that? You're going to get about four days a year that it's all green lights on the way to work. Give me an amen. You're getting about four days a year when you go to the checkout line and everybody (laughs) was in a hurry like you. You're going to get about four days a year that it just, but you know, most of the time we're going to have challenges. Most of the time when you go through life, you're going to say, hey, I I didn't see that one coming. I didn't expect that. Or y'all hear this. You can have two people in this world facing the same challenges the exact same challenges one person's going you know what I'm in this world I'm not of this world I'm not going to be overwhelmed by these circumstances and all these things I'm going to count it all joy I'm going to praise the Lord through this challenge and then you had the same person going through the same experience and you know what they're doing they're mully grubbing they're negative they're just full of negativity you know you're going to get through the battle one way or the other why not do it through joy Paul and Silas were beaten. They were thrown in jail. It was midnight. It was a, it was a, you know, they were Roman citizens. They were not given up fair shake on that deal. But what did they do? They said, you know what? Let's just go ahead and praise God through it all. So today, joy is a choice. Now, Abraham Lincoln made this statement. He said, most people are as happy as they choose to be. Correct? Some people they know. Do you want do you wanna do you wanna be joyful? No. Because see if I do this mully grub thing, if I do this this mully I get a lot of sympathy out of people. Give me an amen here. If I do this little bitter cop and attitude thing, it has a way of getting everybody to kind of go, oh, wanna pet me. <laughs> Can I get an amen? amen. And if I look like I'm enjoying my life, I can't hold that. I can't hold that on somebody else's head. But see, when I sit over here and I act miserable and I act all dried up like a prune, then everybody kind of gets around me and and just comforts me. Now, y'all have heard the story. Have you heard the story of Joyce Meyer? How many have ever heard of a lady named Joyce Meyer? All right. If you haven't, you must live on Mars. Okay. I mean, okay. Joyce Meyer's. Joyce Myers was abused by her father. She was sexually abused. She went through tremendous hurt in her life. And she tells a story how that she, this wasn't for a year. It was, just went on and on and on. Finally, she said, I got married just to get out of the house, and I married a fellow, and he was just a disaster, and then You know, it just talked about her whole problem. Then she said, my husband Dave said, Lord, just send me somebody that needs help. So, okay, I can handle that one. She said, I fit the profile. But anyway, Joyce Myers said one day she was doing the little sour on the world. I'm going to act a certain way, and that kind of plays on everybody's sympathy, and I kind of get everybody to, you know, feel pitiful for me and all that. And she said, and the Lord spoke to her and said this. You can be pitiful or you can be powerful, but you can't be both. 
You can be pitiful or you can be powerful, but you can't be both. And then she tells the story how that this lady came up to her after a meeting and this lady said, oh, Joyce, we're just the same. You know, I've gone through so many things. I was thrown under the bus just like you were thrown under the bus. And I was molested and I had all this sexual abuse and I had all this. And I was thrown under the bus, kept talking about being thrown under the bus. And finally, Joyce Meyer said, but you know, the difference is I decided to get out from under the bus and I'm driving the bus now. <laughs> Y'all, we can be pitiful or we can be powerful but you can't be both. Now, here's where I'm at today. Your joy level is determined whether you're going to live a pitiful life or whether you're going to live a powerful life. Your joy level is whether you're going to be overwhelmed or whether you're going to be an overcomer. Whether you're going to allow yourself to look at everything as, you know, woe is me or is it going to be, wait a minute, in all These things I am more than a conqueror through him who loved me and gave himself for me. So how's your joy level? You say, well, pastor, my joy is doing okay. When I was a baby Christian, when I was just a little baby Christian, I had a lot of joy. But now that I've got mature in the Lord, not so much. Well, nobody, nobody in their right mind believes that if it's a fruit of the Spirit, that the more you grow in the Lord, the less you have. That's like saying, oh, I was a baby Christian. I had a lot of self-control, but now that I'm a mature believer, I have no self-restraint. Well, nobody would say that, but it's a fruit of the Spirit. Oh, when I was a baby Christian, I had a lot of peace, but now that I'm real mature, I don't have an ounce of peace in my life. Nobody would say that. Y'all, if you're going to grow in love, and if you're going to grow in peace, you're going to also grow in the area of joy. And you know how you grow in joy? A lot of it has to do with on purpose saying, you know what? In spite of these circumstances, I'm still going to rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Somebody said, why did he repeat it? Because he knew you didn't get it the first time, right? Repeat that and then say that. Lord, we're going to rejoice in you. Now, I use this illustration Wednesday night, and I'm going to say it again. How many of you have a thermostat in your home? You have a thermostat or You know what I'm talking about? You turn the temperature a certain degree, you know. Did you know that one person can hit that thermostat and one person can change the atmosphere of that whole house? You know, and sometimes you have people and they like it real cold. Then other people, they like it real hot. In other words, you go in the house and some people, Sharon likes to keep it at 68 at night. 68. And then we got one son. It's not only 68, but he keeps a fan on him all night long. And he sleeps without a T-shirt. I'm like, how do you do this? You know. But now here's what I'm going to say. So you got, you got a thermostat that one person affects the atmosphere of the whole house. Now, here's what I want to challenge you. Did you know your atmosphere is being changed many times by one person in that house? It can be changed for the better. It can be changed for the worse. You can be the one that sets the tone. You can be the one that sets the whole atmosphere. Your joy has a way of splashing off on other people. When Paul and Silas were in prison and they were praising God at the midnight hour, the Bible says, and all the prisoners heard them. In other words, and then what happened was it says, and everybody's bands were loosed. Everybody got set free. So it's a picture of not only were Paul and Silas set free, but other people got set free. Whenever we get free and whenever we get full of joy, it's amazing how it has a way of splashing out on other people. Have you ever gone to one of these home improvement stores 
and you want to know where all the people are that work there. How many have ever, has that ever happened? Again? And you go, the people on the commercial, where are those people? We need to see them. Well, Sharon and I were at a store the other night, and we were, it had been a long day, and we were walking up down the aisle, and, and there was this couple, older couple, come around the corner, and I go, oh, I said, oh, I was hoping you guys might work here. And they go, no, we don't work here. He said, home improvement for us is changing a light bulb. That's what he told me. <laughs> and, and we were looking at light bulbs. And, and so we were up and down the aisle, and, and about that time, this fella come around wearing a, a uniform for this business. And he come around the corner, and as soon as I saw him, I said, hallelujah. Yeah, I just said, hallelujah. And that lady just cracked up. It was like that lady was like, that is so funny. <laughs> Y'all, everybody's blaspheming the name. Why don't we bless his name? So we had a guy working on the house this week. And he's working, and he was, you know, digging around, working on something. And he needed to install a part, and it was the wrong part. And I could already tell by listening to these fellows, they were, they're wonderful people. And so anyway, I, I was, they were working on the house, and so as they were working, they got the wrong part, and they were flustered. And I said, hey, I'm here for you. I'm your gopher, man. I can get it. I said, you know, I can't, there's a lot of things I can't do, but I can chase parts. And so we said, well, we need this. And I got on the phone, and I called, and I found this part. And as soon as this lady said, we got what you need, I just said, hallelujah. And this guy looked up at me, and he just smiled. Now, that's two people this week. Um, how many know there's a lot of people that they're hearing everybody curse the name of the Lord? If they get around some people that are blessing the name of the Lord, it make a difference. We can change the atmosphere. We can glorify the name of the Lord. Can I tell you, all church is not a place where we come to just, oh, I'm just going to tell God all my problems. Did you know what God knows what things we have need of before we ask him? He already knows what things you have need of. In fact, in, I, in the book of Isaiah, it says, even before you speak, I'm going to say, here am I. The psalmist said, before I even say it, he knows me altogether. God knows what's in our life. What we need to do is not just focus on the problem. Let's use our words not to establish problems. Let's use our words to establish the answer. And in the midst of the thing, we shall decree a thing, and it shall be established unto us. Did you know everybody speaks to mountains? Jesus said, say to the mountain, be thou removed. Everybody's talking to mountains. Everybody you met this week, everybody you met this week, they were talking to a mountain. Some people were telling that mountain, you're getting bigger, you're permanent, I'm never going to get over you. And then there was another group of people that were speaking to the mountain, and they were saying, be removed and be cast into the sea. So everybody's talking to the mountain, whether they realize it or not. Some people are saying, I'll never get over you, mountain. Other people are saying, no, get out of the way. In the name of Jesus, we're going through. So your joy level, you set the tone. You set the atmosphere. You can't wait for everything to be idealistic. Did you know Paul, the apostle Paul, when the Lord came to him and spoke to him, and he said, I'm going to show you many things that you're going to suffer for my name's sake. Now, what do you mean by that? Paul went through a lot. You take times, he said, five times I was beaten 39 lashes, over 190 lashes. I mean, how many people do you know that got beat like that? But he's the one writing to churches, encouraging them. Even in Acts chapter 16, when he was beaten and they drove him out of town, he went back and encouraged that church before he left to go on to the next city. Y'all, you know, it's not what you're going through, really, that's determining your joy. Because you can have two people facing the same thing. It's your attitude, and that is, Lord, in the midst of all this, I'm going to praise God because you're working in this situation. Amen. Everybody say, God is working. Yeah, that's a confession you can make. I've said that in times. How are things going? Oh, God's working. I mean, no, that's true. God is working. I mean, he's always working. And so you can just say all things are working together for the good. Even at times when you don't have any idea how things are going. You know, all things are working together for good. Angels are working on our behalf right now. 
I heard a guy that had a child that was wayward. And this, this daughter was wayward, and he said, Lord, what am I supposed to say when people ask about her? What am I supposed to say? Because I don't want to establish some negative. What am I supposed to say? And he said, the Lord told him this. Say, God is turning her heart even as I speak right now. And so every time the people say, how's she doing? Oh, God's turning her heart even as I say that right now. It's happening right now. God's turning their heart. And he said the illustration God gave him was, you know, when a heart turns many times, it's just a little bit at a time. And when people come around, we want it to be flip-flop overnight. But, you know, many times it can be layers where they just begin to see, oh, this isn't working, this isn't working, this isn't working. How many can look at your life and say, God worked in my life, and it was in increments? And it wasn't his problem. It was me. In other words, it was us sometimes that wouldn't take, the foot, wouldn't take our foot off the brake to allow him to work. So we're going to talk about joy, and we're going to emphasize joy. And we're going to remind ourselves that Jesus said this, and he said in John 16, 22, Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice. Notice this. And your joy no one will take from you. Nobody's going to be able to take away your joy. Amen. So we've got to keep this joy in our heart. Now, we had a, we had a y'all missed Wednesday night, we had a funny service. And we just started talking about joy, and then I said, what happens when joy reaches its maximum? What happens? Laughter. When joy peaks out, it turns into laughter. In other words, you can tell a joke, or you can hear something or see something that's funny, and you smile, and you get a grin, but whenever that bucket overflows, what happens? You start laughing. Y'all, do you know church needs to be a place where there's not only crying at times, but there is laughing at times. And as Sharon said, if you just go to any ball game and you, you just, if you got up and the scoreboard's broken and you're trying to figure out who's winning this game, you just look over at the crowd on this side and then you look at the faces of the crowd of the people right over here and look at the faces of the crowd of the people right over here and whatever side has the most smiles, is, that's the side that's winning. And let me tell you, the church, we're winning, people. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And what we've got to do is say, Lord, we're going to keep the joy in the midst of adversity, in the midst of difficult times in our life. Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, and a broken spirit drieth the bones. The Amplified says, a happy heart is a good medicine, and a cheerful mind works healing. There's something medicinal. There's something that's therapeutic when you just stay in joy. I'm going I'm to rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to praise the Lord. Have you ever realized that sometimes things happen, and they're not real joyful at the moment, but when you look back in six months, you think, that was really hilarious. You look at it and you go, this is not real funny. But you look back and you go, but God, you sure were faithful. And so some of the things you're going through right now, the biggest, maybe it's the biggest challenge of your life. You're being stretched. You're being pulled. Every part of you is being stretched. But hear, hear this. You've got to learn to exercise joy. It's not something that you do, count it all joy, consider it all joy. It's a discipline. It's like, no, wait a minute. We're going to stay in joy. We're going to stir up the joy of the Lord. Now, why do I say that? A lot of people think it's strictly a raw emotion. So go over to Luke chapter 6 with me, and let's look at this scripture today. Luke chapter 6, and um, let's just think about joy as a de decision that we make, not just a raw emotion or... Everything's just so perfect that I'm just full of joy. I want you to think of it as a time whenever you are purposing to walk in joy. So I'm in Luke chapter 6 and verse number 22. And Jesus made this statement. Actually, we'll start in verse number 21. He said, blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Now notice verse 22. 
Blessed are you when people hate you. Okay, if you had your options, how many would rather be loved than hated? Do you just wake up in the morning just just want people to hate you? No, just human nature, you'd rather be loved than hated. But Jesus said, blessed, look, up, look it up in the Greek, it means spiritually happy. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil. Now, how many of you in the natural, you just wake up and you're just in an intrinsically good mood and somebody said, why are you such a good mood today? Because people hate me. Because people are excluding me. People are reviling me. People are spurning my name as being evil. And notice this, on account of the Son of Man, because of your walk with the Lord. Now, how in the world are you going to have joy in those circumstances? It's a choice. It's not just raw emotions. It's not because you just love the fact that people are behind your back excluding you and hating you and reviling you and spurning you and on account of you doing all this. It's a choice that you're making. Now notice verse 23. Rejoice in that day. Notice this. And do what? Leap for what? Now I haven't had any services where I see somebody just up here going, whoo! Say, hey, what's going on? I mean, did you win? I started to say win the lottery, but I know you're not playing the lottery. But I, I, I mean, you know, you, you, you asked somebody, did you, you know, what happened? Why are you up there? Why are you doing this? Oh, what is it? You know, in your mind, you're thinking, man, something happened. They just got a raise. or they just, Oh, because people are spurning me, excluding me. People are revi- You know what that tells me? It's a choice. It's a decision. And it's a very wise decision. And can I remind you, these are the words of Jesus. And I don't think when you get to heaven, he's going to say, oh, we flipped gears. We're not doing that anymore. I know he's going to say, no, that's it. That's it. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Behold, your reward is great in heaven. Here's what you got to do. When you're going through the hard times, Think about heaven more than you're thinking about earth. Think about the heaven side of the equation. How many believe in heaven right now there's rejoicing? There's heaven. The heaven's a place of rejoicing. Places enter into the joy of the Lord. Matthew 25. My scripture got taken down there. But here, here it is. Ready? For great in heaven. Your reward is great in heaven. So their fathers did the prophets. Now you say, Pastor, that's just one isolated reference there. We see that. Oh, let's go over to Matthew chapter 5. Now, I'm going to wrap this up, but I'm trying to emphasize to you that your joy is not because everything is joyful or everything's idealistic, everything's perfect, everything's flowing smooth as silk. You know, I talked to a fellow the other day, and it was Friday, and I said, so how you doing? He said, everything's great. I hadn't had any problems all week. Everything worked exactly the way I thought it was. Everything just flowed. He was being sarcastic. Y'all, if our joy level is only if everything's perfect, that's a pretty shallow joy level. And now here's what I'm going to tell you. Here's what the truth is. The world has that. The world has that. If the world's happy, it's because things are happening. But if we're happy, it's because things are happening in the spirit realm. And the spirit realm affects the natural realm, so we're going to go ahead and rejoice in the Lord. Now notice Matthew chapter 5. Again, Jesus made this statement. Verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. You know, he's saying here, you need to do things that go contrary to your instinct. You need to learn to do things that 
naturally speaking, you want to go one way, but choose to love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more do Are you doing than others? What are you doing any different than the world is what I'm trying to get at. Jesus is saying, look, if you're just acting, you know, a lot of times we hear the phrase worldly. Worldly. Well, you know what worldly is on a certain level? Whenever your joy is totally predicated on everything being perfect. Did you know the Apostle Paul was in the will of God his entire life? But can I tell you, the Apostle Paul had challenges plenty of days of his life. And you can be doing exactly what the Lord wants you to do, and you can have some challenges. So the joy bucket. What's in your bucket? Is it worry, unforgiveness, stress, fear? Financial pressure, I mean, stress in relationships. What, what is in your bucket? Sin? Things that are, you know, just weighing heavy on you? Get them all out. And you know what you need to do is just, Lord, I'm going to stay in your presence. Because, see, here's what happens. In the presence of God is fullness of what? So what is the valuable lesson behind praying in the language of the Spirit? Praying in other tongues is found in Acts chapter 2 and other references in the Bible. It allows you to pray beyond what you know in your mind. So when you know stuff up here, you're, you're really concerned about things. But whenever you pray in the Spirit, the Lord lets you go around that, and you're not praying according to your three-pound brain, but you're praying according to the Spirit of living God that lives in you. And all of a sudden, now you're praying over stuff. And here's what it allows you to do. You're able to have tremendous peace even when in your mind you would have concern. In other words, if I tried to analyze this, I think, oh my Lord, what's going on here? But I'm going to just begin to pray in the language of the Spirit. And when I pray in the Spirit, you're not praying the problem, you're praying the answer. And you know what you're doing? You're just right on track. Now, I'll say this. People that spend a lot of time praying in the Spirit, they don't leave the prayer meeting discouraged. Oh, why are you so discouraged? Oh, I've been praying in the Spirit. Because here's what happens. The Bible says, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself. So really, we would say it this way. The most encouraged people on planet Earth or let me say it this way, among the most encouraged people on planet Earth should be that group of people that have tapped into praying in the language of the Spirit. Why? Because you're able to just build yourself up. You're able to pray. Jude verse 20 says, building yourselves up on the most holy faith, praying in the language of the Spirit. So as we pray in the Spirit, it builds us up. It helps us stay encouraged. Have you ever had a crisis? And I'm going to wrap up by saying this. You were praying about it, and as you prayed about it, your mind was really troubled. But the longer you prayed in the Spirit, you found yourself just laughing and rejoicing, knowing it's going to be all right. It's going to be fine. I've had that happen. And then you get back in your head, and you start going, oh! And then you begin to pray in the Spirit, and the Lord's saying, it's okay. I'm going to go before you. I'm going to make the crooked path straight. But then you get back in your head, and you, oh, what are we going to do? And the Lord just keeps bringing you back. Now, why, what's the benefit of you praying in the language of the Spirit? Hear this, church. There is a joy that you can tap into. The Bible talks about with joy you shall draw from the wells of salvation. There's a well of salvation in you, and as you begin to just pull from that, Counsel is in the heart of every man, and a man of understanding knows how to draw that counsel out. And as you just begin to pull upon that, So today, I got good news. Did you know joy came with you to church? Oh, Pastor, I I don't have an ounce of joy. Are you saved? Oh, yeah, I'm saved, 100% saved, completely saved. I heard about it this morning. (laughs) Y'all, 
did you know the Holy Spirit's not moving in, moving out, moving in, moving out? Got a crisis. Oh, I left you. I, I'm gone, dude. I mean, God doesn't do that. He's in you in the storm. He's in you right now. And you know what? The greater one's in us. And that would be a great confession to make. Lord, your joy is in me today. And here's what happens. The joy of the Lord is going to be your strength. Father, we thank you today for the joy of the Lord that is in us because the Holy Spirit is in us today. And Father, we stir up joy today, Lord. We stir up your joy in us today, Father. And Lord, I don't know what people are facing in this room. I don't know what crisis is going on. But Lord, I do know this. There is not one season of our life that you say to us, there is no joy for this season every season of our life there can be a calm delight there can be a spirit of gladness that's upon us even in the most difficult crisis of life hallelujah and I pray for everyone in this room I pray everyone in this room would value the language of the spirit people in this room that haven't prayed in that language that they would stir it up today and maybe they've never been filled with the Holy Spirit and spoken in other tongues. Lord, you would just help them today to get past all the mental hurdles that are in their mind and they would realize it's for now and it's for this earth. Praise God. Now here's what I would say. Somebody say, Pastor, you really think I need to get baptized in the Holy Spirit and pray in the language of the Spirit? Now here's what I'm saying. Are you planning on going to heaven this afternoon? Like in an hour or so, are you planning on going to heaven in an hour? And they say, oh, no, I'm not going to heaven in the next hour. So, okay, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. All right. What do I mean by that? Because, see, in this world, man, it's crazy. And guess what? When you, you pray in the language of the Spirit, it's like, oh, yeah, oh, hallelujah. You're, just, you're not any more saved. You're not any more righteous. But it's just a greater portion. It's just a greater measure of his spirit. Let's all stand up. Father, we bless you today. We glorify. Come on. You got to stir it up. You got to cast those cares. I can't cast the care for you. Father, we bless you today. We glorify your name, Lord. Lord, we bless you. We praise you today, Father, that you're in us. You're big in us, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, just let the river flow. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Father, we glorify your holy name, Lord. Thank you, Father. Praise the Lord. Father, fill us today afresh and anew, Lord. Fill us today afresh and anew, Lord. We cast every care, every anxiety. Lord, where there is strife in people's lives, I just pray, Father, that they would just release forgiveness. So you know what? Let's just forget about that. Let's just let that go. Father, we bless you. We thank you today. We thank you today for the joy of the Lord. Praise you, Father God. We bless you today. We thank you today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I pray, Lord, that that little pitiful spirit will get broken off everybody, Lord. We don't have a pitiful spirit. We have a powerful spirit. In the name of Jesus, we're not a victim of anything. We're victorious in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, we don't need anybody feeling sorry for us. We got the word. Yes, divine compassion, we receive that. But Lord, we just thank you. We are overcomers in this world. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Come on.